Hello and welcome to the evening news for today, Monday, December 15, 2014. I'm Avinash Ramzan. Thanks for joining us in the headlines. Miss Guyana places in top 10 of Miss World contest. Rohi says 2001 constitution is best Guyana ever had. Rice export is surpassed 500,000 tons. Stall owners suffer as city workers down tools. Linden businessman doused with acid and GDF rank arraigned for friends murder. Now for the news in detail. We start off by telling you that Miss Guyana World, 21-year-old Rafia Hussein, has broken the drought that has plagued Guyana for the past 43 years to secure one of the top 10 places in the Miss World pageant when it was hosted in England on Sunday. The details from Bisham Mohammed. Hussein has now joined other Guyanese women who have been successful in past Miss World pageants, including Shakira Bash, who placed a third in the same pageant in 1967, Pamela Lord, who came in fourth in 1969, and Nalini Munusar, who placed a third in 1971. The stunning beauty who hails from Anna Regina on the Escriba Coast was named in the top 10 in the contest, which saw 121 other delegates vying for top honors. In a subsequent telephone interview with the Guyanese beauty in her hotel room in London, express her relatedness. I honestly, when they started calling top 10 and they reached in because they ranked it according to um, a point at that time. So they started with 10 being the, um, the lowest going up to 1 being the highest. And after they announced the fifth, I was like, oh my goodness, I didn't make it. I didn't make it because there were so many other great contenders. But when they called Guyana, I was like, oh my gosh, I could actually have this. Hussein also tied in the beauty with a purpose contest with Miss India, Miss Indonesia, Miss Brazil and Miss Kenya. She explained more about this aspect of the pageant and more so her project that is based on domestic violence. I was a victim and I felt that it was something that was prevalent not only in Guyana but around the world. And for me, I started thinking of, you know what, what can I do to help the community? And one of the things was that being born from Region 2 and representing Region 2 in the national level at Miss Diana, I decided that I was going to um, open an outreach center for victims in memory of my grandfather, who was the regional chairman, regional executive officer of Region 2, with Mr. Shafi Khan. Okay. And so the outreach center was named after him and the grand opening will be in February. More so, she has been bestowed with the title of Miss World Caribbean and hopes to use the title to further promote her stance on domestic violence. It's such an honor, I mean, to be named the Miss World Caribbean. You are now associating yourself with not just one country, with, but um, different countries around the Caribbean and now around the world because you're... You're Caribbean for the world, if you get what I'm saying. Yes. And so I, I'm truly honored and I'm truly glad that Guyana can be represented once again. That can show that, you know what, we have what it takes as well. Our girls are smart, they're brilliant, and we're paving the way for the future. Hussein plans to return to Guyana in the new year when she will officially commission a shelter for women that have been victims of domestic violence. She took the opportunity to thank persons who had the confidence in her as a potential Miss World delegate. I would really, really have to thank my mom and my aunt. Um, they have been my biggest, biggest, biggest supporters through this all. Um, the Miss World Guyana organization, uh, Region 2, the regional executive offices, the government of Region 2, all everyone there, the community that came together to help me with our outreach center, they have been so supportive, especially where it comes to my grandfather. He was a big philanthropist within the community and everyone else. Meanwhile, Miss South Africa 22-year-old Rolene South was crowned Miss World 2014. Miss Hungry Edina Kalizir took the first... General Secretary of the People's Progressive Party Civic Clement Rohi today defended the 2001 amended constitution, claiming that it is the best Guyana has ever had. The details from Alexis Rodney. Rohi said that Guyanese should be proud of the achievements since they have all played a role in shaping the set of fundamental principles which govern their country. Unlike the 1980 constitution, which for all practical purposes was an imposition by the then PNC regime, our present 2001 constitution benefited from a series of nationwide consultations between 1999 and 2001. During those consultations, the inputs of a wide cross-section of Guyanese, including organized labor, 
religious and cultural organizations, and all the groups participated in the Constitution reform. The reform, now 13 years old, is considered one of the better rule of governance across developing countries. Indeed, Ghana today boasts one of the most advanced constitutions in our, in our region, if not beyond, which is a far cry from what was described as a messy, horrible, and even 17th century constitution. And therefore, at complete odds with the suggestion that the need for a new constitution where all fundamental rights are clearly defined. The party's general secretary said constitutions should not be tampered with by neither government nor any political opposition because of any difference. Opposition leader David Granger had said that there was still more to be desired from government and its role in constitutional reform. He said bearing in mind the many articles within the constitution, there must be consensus between government and the political opposition. Granger had also claimed that many of the reforms which were identified for the new constitution in 2001 are yet to come on stream. For the Evening News, I'm Alexis Rodney. Leader of a Partnership for National Unity, David Granger, has said that the leadership of any coalition between APNU and the Alliance for Change is not the most pressing matter to be addressed at the moment. Let's find out why in this report. From all indications, it would seem as though Granger is unwilling to relinquish his interest in leading any future coalition with the party and is therefore downplaying any talks about leadership in this respect. Granger pointed out that other fundamental values have to be worked out as a matter of importance when the two parties begin discussions. According to the leader of the opposition, the APNU and AFC are two different parties with different values and the direction and values have to be worked out. He also noted that other issues such as party finances, among others, also have to be high priority on the discussion agenda when the two parties meet for discussions next week. He explained to the Evening News that thereafter, discussions relevant to leadership of the coalition could take center stage. According to Granger, it would be inappropriate to prejudice the talks with discussions. The opposition leader maintained that at this point, the APNU is looking forward to what the AFC has to say when the discussions ensue. Reporting for the Evening News, I am Ryden James. Stallholders of the two city markets and the municipal abattoir on Monday expressed their concerns in light of the recent strike actions by city workers, hoping that normalcy will be restored soon. Royden James was there and filed a report. These people are supposed to pay no stand rent for the month of December. 15 days to close up. How many days to close up? 15 days. Right, plus with this and plus with the flood, and this thing has come to me for money, they got to be mad, man. Have you received any word from the city council as to When city council don't tell you nothing, sober or over, whatever the woman name, she don't say a thing. That was one of the stall holders at the border market this morning venting her frustration over the current situation. But when the evening news visited the city council, a pandemonium broke out among other concerned business people. <laughs> When asked to what actions will be taken to ensure that the situation returns to a normal state, the acting town clerk had this to say. I am not in a position to say that right now because the union met with me a little while ago and the wrong robin is uh, sent out again for the mayor and councillors to sign because the deputy mayor has no authority unilaterally to say that it can't be paid because the deputy mayor is just an ordinary councillor according to law, when the mayor is in the jurisdiction. And I learned also that she misled the stallholders of the market, that I was the reason for the closure. According to his worship, Mayor Hamilton Green, he is not aware as to when the markets will be reopened, since that's not his decision. Well, the close of the markets uh, <coughs> represent the microcosm of a situation which we as mayor and councils of Georgetown complained about on umpteen occasions where you have the chief executive officer who feels she's a law unto her own self. I empathize, I'm in complete sympathy with the stallholders 
and the inconvenience that the public is at the moment suffering. Ryden James reporting for the Evening News. A Linden businessman was admitted to the Mackenzie Hospital in a serious condition after his reputed wife doused him with acid during a misunderstanding. The businessman, popularly known as Chicken, and runs the popular Chicken Bar on Republic Avenue in Linden, was reportedly about to head into his bathroom on Sunday evening when an argument ensued between him and his reputed wife over an infidelity acquisition. After the incident, the businessman was rushed to the medical facility while the woman escaped and has not been seen since. The man received severe burns to the face, upper body and thighs. According to reports, the couple shared a rocky relationship since the woman would frequently accuse him of being involved with other women. Residents and close friends say that they were fearful that a day would come when the situation would turn violent. The police have launched an investigation into the matter. Morning, Salahat. Stay tuned. This is the Evening News. Welcome back. The Acting Chief Justice Ian Chang on Tuesday granted the government seven days to file an affidavit in response to a Partnership for National Unity's court order which accused the government of unauthorized spending. Following the in-chamber proceedings, Attorney General and Legal Affairs Minister Anil Nandlal said he's baffled by APNU's move to the courts. Nandalal was not sure what the issue was since funding through the national budget has been cut and legally restored in the past. He noted that past restorations have been approved by the opposition. Attorney Basil Williams of APNU filled an ex parte application for an interim and conservatory order to put a stay on all spending and or any further spending by the finance minister or other ministers of the government until the conclusion of the matter. The matter will return to the Chief Justice Chambers on December 29 for reports. In the last case, Chang has ruled that the opposition has no right to cut the country's budget estimates and can only approve or disapprove the entire budget or sections of it. The government of Ghana had taken the opposition to court following the slashing of the 2012 national budget by $20.8 billion, claiming that it was unconstitutional. Rice exports for 2014 will exceed 500,000 tons, but more than $3 billion is still owed to farmers. More from Svetlana Marshall. Ghana has thus far recorded a production of 633,000 tons of rice for 2014, 100,000 more than 2013. Agriculture Minister Dr. Leslie Ramsamy made this disclosure on Monday at a specially convened press conference at his Regent Street office. According to him, as of Friday last, exports stood at 481,000 tons. I do know that this weekend we also ship and this coming week we are shipping so that um, with what we have as contracts to be delivered before December 31st, mm -hmm. we are set to exceed 500,000 tons in export. The Agriculture Minister Ford disclosed that party sales by farmers would have exceeded $45 billion, with export earnings standing at U.S. $250 million. However, he expressed disappointment that some millers still owe farmers. As of Friday, we have an outstanding payment of about $3.5 billion from the millers to farmers. I'm hoping that at least half of that will be paid off this week. The Agriculture Ministry will be hosting a meeting with farmers during this week to agree on a payment strategy. Swetlana Marshall reporting for the Evening News. A fisherman who hails from Region 4 has reportedly seen a whale approximately one and a half hours offshore. That was on Friday night, Agriculture Minister Dr. Leslie Ramsamy disclosed earlier today. According to the fisherman, the whale, which was twice the size of a 45-footer boat, was trapped in his seine. However, when the Ghana Defence Force Coast Guard revisited the site on Sunday, neither the whale nor the seine could have been found. In addition to the Agriculture Ministry and the GDF, Conservation International is investigating the report. Despite promising to retain the primary model to elect its presidential candidate back in 2011, leader of the People's National Congress Reform, David Granger, now says that a mechanism is not a requirement of the party's constitution and is unlikely to be used to determine the selection upcoming at the upcoming polls. More from Alexis Rodney. 
Speaking with the evening news on Friday, Granger said the system of primaries, which was used for selecting a presidential candidate for the party, was never used again since former leader Robert Corbyn demitted office in 2010. He said the party will not be utilizing it for general and regional elections expected before the end of the first quarter of 2015. In 2010, then PNCR leader Robert Corbyn, while indicating that he did not want to be considered a candidate for the upcoming polls in 2011, had established a system where party primaries were held across the country in the selection of a new presidential candidate. Um, there is no provision under the Constitution which calls for um, the system to which you referred. And it was only because of the demitting of office from, by Mr. Corbyn that a decision was taken to put in place um, a process for the selection of the presidential candidate. But it's not a constitutional requirement on the PNC. So it hasn't been happening, well, it hasn't happened for this period? No, it, 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 it never happened before and it is not in the constitution. Okay. Following the primaries in 2011, when Granger competed against Greenwich, James Bond, Dr. Faith Harding, and Basil Williams, the then leader Robert Corbyn had hailed the historic nature and significance of the special congress, which was held to elect the presidential candidate. Corbyn said back then that the congress ought to be appreciated, even as he pointed out that the party had in fact been able to break new grounds in Guyana through its efforts to lead the way in a transformation of the political culture here. Corbyn had also assured that irrespective of who emerges as a successful presidential candidate, all in the PNCR should feel proud of having participated in that process. For the Evening News, I'm Lexis Rodden. Welcome back. This is the Evening News. Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority, Kershit Sattar, has confirmed that more than half of Ghana's registered value-added tax collectors do not remit the money collected to government at a scheduled time. More in this report. The Commissioner General has said that some shrewd businessmen have found ways to cheat the system and keep some or all of the monies paid to them by customers. Sitar stated that while businesses are registered to charge VAT, most times the counting systems are severely flawed, which results in them not paying the full amounts collected to the Revenue Authority. This means that the government gets cheated out of possibly millions of dollars each year in revenue. He explained, too, that these businesses are able to thwart the VAT system with the aid of both complicit and unsuspecting customers. He said that this is done when the customer is offered the option of not receiving a bill for their purchases, in which case they pay marginally less for the item. However, they have no way of knowing whether it is an accurate amount. Satar also remarked that businesses have found ways to receive more than what is due to them when they are claiming VAT refunds. According to Satar, some businesses go to the extent of manufacturing receipts for VAT paid to import produce. Others have also altered receipts to claim more than what was actually paid. Annually, the revenue body pays more than $3.5 billion in VAT refunds to businesses. Refunds are covered under Section 35.1 of the Value Added Tax Act. Reporting for the Evening News, I'm Erica Williams. After several negotiations with the City Council for a 5% increase, it is now unsure whether the Ghana local government offices will be given their increase. Find out why from Rodin James. Local government officers have taken a decision to down tools after they were not given a salary increase promised to them by the city council. In an interview with the Evening News, acting town clerk Carol Sober said that the ball is in the court of the mayor who has to decide when and how the officers will be given their increases. Also, we cannot pay because the honorable minister has to approve any increases for them. What actually happened? Last uh, statutory on the 8th, they suspended the, all meetings for some frivolous reasons. And the president of the union, Mr. Dale Beresford, met with the mayor on the 9th of December. And he agreed that a wrong robin should be sent out. 
so that the councillors can sign approving the recommendation for the payment. But as the blame game continues, Green said the ball is in sober score to decide on how the officers will be paid. I received a very rude an absurd letter from Ms. Sober saying she could not summon the meeting. I sent a second letter saying that that letter was unacceptable and that the meeting should be convened based on the law and the authority vested in the mayor and his office. Deputy Mayor Patricia Chase Green maintained that the manner in which they were approached by the acting town clerk to pay out millions of dollars was unacceptable. When negotiations start, the GLU came to the table and it was agreed that they would pay 5% along with an increase of uniform allowance from 9000 to 12000 The mayor requested on Friday last an emergency meeting for Tuesday to deal with this money. Ms. Suba wrote back saying she has other things to do and she will not be holding the meeting. Lo and behold, the meeting was not held. We have received documentation for a PNT meeting that has nothing to do with this money. President of the GLGOU, Dale Beresford, also expressed his disappointment with the attitude of the top officials. We did not negotiate on behalf of the councillors. We negotiate on behalf of the technical, professional and clerical staff of the Mayor and Council of the City of Georgetown. The councillors was adamant that there will be no meeting for the rest of the year. They've called an extraordinary meeting and we have no assurance that this matter will be dealt with amicably at that extraordinary meeting. Additionally, there's always a cussing out and a disagreement at every statutory meeting for the past couple of months. We are asking that the matter be wrong, Robin, and it will be approved. As a result of the strike actions, the city markets and municipal abattoir remain closed. As officers noted, they will not be returning to work unless they are being given their increases. Royd and James, reporting for the Evening News. The holiday season is one of giving and sharing, and in keeping with this spirit, the Lions Club of Georgetown, Stabrook, hosted its annual children Christmas party. The Venus Amru reports. Over 250 children were part of the Georgetown Starbrook Lions Club annual children's Christmas party, which was held on Sunday last at the St. Stephen's Primary School. The children were treated to goodies and games, face painting, and a chance to meet Santa Claus and Minnie Mouse. Vice President of the club, Hemard Silal, said they will always be motivated to host the party as it puts a priceless smile on the faces of the children who are selected. Well, we are we are always excited about about Christmas because this is something the kids look for to George and Sarah Lions Club. We've been doing this for a number of years. So we're always excited about this. So you come here, you see all these kids, you know, there's nothing more pleasing about this here. The children were drawn from several sections of Georgetown, including Lepole Street, Albaistung, High Street, and others. The Venus Samaru for the Evening News. And of course now, Alistair Wolford, age 20 of Republic Street Kitty, was on Tuesday arraigned with the murder of his friend, Devon Howell, who was reportedly accidentally shot while he was cleaning his service firearm. The Ghana Defense Force rank was not required to plead to the indictment, which stated that on December 8 at Lot 100 Public Street Kitty, he unlawfully murdered Howell. He appeared before Magistrate Anne McLennan at a Georgetown Magistrate's Court. Howell, age 20 of Lot 87, the Silver Street Kitty, Georgetown, was shot to his neck and was being treated in the intensive care unit of the Georgetown Public Hospital until the time of his death about a week ago. Wilford was make his next court appearance on January 5, 2015. Stay tuned, your regional, international and bridge reports are still ahead. This is the Evening News. Welcome back. In the region now, hundreds of Brazilian police officers and their relatives have taken part in a protest in Rio de Janeiro to demand tougher legislation for crimes against the police. They are demanding changes in the penal code so that the killing of police officers be treated as heinous crimes. Eight officers were killed in the line of duty in Rio this year alone. 
In most cases, they died fighting the criminal gangs that control many of the city's shanty towns or favelas. During the week, protesters laid crosses on the sand of Copacabana Beach with the names of the dead. Wearing predominantly black, some 500 people staged a march on Sunday to raise awareness to the problem. Internationally now, two people died along with an Islamist gunman after commandos stormed a cafe in Sydney, Australia to bring an end to a 16-hour siege. The gunman, identified as an Iranian refugee, had taken dozens of hostages. Four people were injured, including a policeman hit by gunshot pellets. The center of the town was put in lockdown when a gunman seized the hostages early on Monday, forcing some of them to hold up a black Islamic banner at a window of a cafe. A 34-year-old man and a woman aged 38 were pronounced dead after being taken to hospital, as was the gunman, the New South Wales pol Police said in a statement. Two women suffered non-life-threatening non injuries, as did a policeman who had been hit in the face by pellets. Another woman suffered a gunshot wound to her shoulder. In case of just joining us, this is the evening news. We now take a look at your bridge reports. The Damrara Harbour Bridge is expected to be closed from 13 hours on Tuesday, December 16, for a period of one and a half hours. And the Burberry Silver Bridge is expected to be closed from 12 hours 10 on Tuesday, December 16, for a period of one and a half hours. So that's after the break for sports, sponsored by MacWorp. This is the evening news. presents a few more challenges. Keeping your business running shouldn't be one of them. That's why we work every day towards ensuring your overall satisfaction. With over 100 skilled technicians and engineers equipped with the tools and skills to help you do more. With the largest parts inventory in Guyana, over 10,000 line items readily available. Driven by your success, is not just a set of words to us. It is a code by which we live. That is why we are proud to say that we are proud. Welcome back. Now for a look at sport, but first the headlines. North Rheinfeld crowned Georgetown's Guinness Street Football Champions. Stella Maris Stint Stevens to contest girls Pee Wee final. Team Bonn edged Team Tony at basketball. And Steven Smith appointed Australia Test Captain. Of course, this podcast comes with the kind compliments of MacWorp. Every day presents a few more challenges. Keeping your business running shouldn't be one of them. That's why we work every day towards ensuring your overall satisfaction. With over 100 skilled technicians and engineers equipped with the tools and skills to help you do more. With the largest parts inventory in Guyana, over 10,000 line items readily available. Driven by your success is not just a set of words to us. It is a code by which we live. That is why we are proud to say that we are proud. Welcome back. We start off with some football news. A new champion has been crowned in the Georgetown zone of the Guinness Greatest in the Streets Futsal Competition, which concluded last evening at the National Park Tarmac. Tristan Joseph was there and filed this report. North Romvelt are the new champions of the tournament with a 2-0 win over Festival City Warriors. The game was played at full throttle from start to finish as both teams showed intent to win. However, with time winding down and overtime seemed a definite possibility, Gerald getting struck in the 37th minute to send the fans at the National Park into a frenzy. The faces of the Festival City players told its own story as Travis Grant added insult to injury with a goal in the 39th minute to seal the win. Meanwhile, in the third place playoff, Lapole Street defeated Sparta Boss 2 1. Omalo Williams and Claudio Raj Kumar were the goal scorers for Lapole Street, while Sheldon Shepard was the lone scorer for Sparta Boss. Brand manager for Guinness, Lee Baptist, was happy with the tournament, especially the fact that every year crowns a new winner. Every year, 
a different team is, is, is a different team is winning, which, which shows the the enthusiasm and the motivation of the other teams to come the following year better prepared than they were in the, 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 the previous year. Baptiste also noted the tournament's role in society. It's it's not it's not just about uh, football, but it's really about giving social some constructive social activity within the communities. And I hope they appreciate it. And anybody with ideas how we could better you know better do things for the community, constructive um, social activities, feel free. You know, give us a shout, give us a call. Next year the national aspect of the tournament will be held in order to name the team that will represent Guyana at the regional tournament. Meanwhile, St. Stephen's and Stella Maris have secured two coveted spots in the final of the inaugural Petra Organization's Girls Under 11 Primary School Football Competition following the penultimate day of action at the Education Ministry ground on Carafest Avenue on Sunday. The details in this report. Apart from the two semifinals, there were four other games to determine positions 5 to 12. Both semifinals had to be decided by sudden death penalty kicks after regulation time failed to produce a clear winner. Stella Maris won 2 0 on the spot kicks against West Rheinfeld after both schools failed to score. We caught up with one of the Stella Maris players, Alicia Reynolds, who expressed confidence in lifting the title. I feel okay. I know we're going to make it there. I know, I know, I feel okay. I know we're going to make it there. Okay, um, who's the expectations for the final? We expect to win and not lose. In the other final four match, St. Stephen's pipped favorites Enterprise in an exciting shootout that ended 10-9. The two teams had earlier played to a one-all stalemate when the final whistle was blown. Akisha Glasgow had put Enterprise ahead in the third minute before Odell Strawn equalized 21 minutes later. In the playoff for positions 5 and 6, South Rheinfeld edged Tugville 1-0 with Kia Phillips netting in the fifth minute, while in the playoff for spots 7 and 8, North Georgetown threw an Angel Denny goal, needled F.E. Pollard 1-0. St. Pius also won 1-0 over St. Margaret's in the 9-10 playoff with Brittany Sampson scoring the all-important goal while East Lepanitans won by walkover from Smith's Memorial in the 11-12 playoff. The grand final and third place playoff will take place on Thursday afternoon at the same venue. The competition is a collaborative effort of the Petra organization, Health Guyana 2000, the Health Ministry and Anse McCall Trading under its smaller brand. Now for some basketball news. Team Bond emerged champions of the Respect the Game basketball charity event that took place on Saturday evening at the Cliff Anderson Sports Hall. Tristan Joseph witnessed what turned out to be a close encounter and filed this report. Award-winning sports journalist Edison Jefford weaved his way through traffic to hit the game-winning layup with 30 seconds left to give Team Bonner a 59-58 win over Team Tony. Raul Tony would miss a buzzer beater with 1.5 seconds left on the shot clock that would have won the game had it gone in. However, Akeem the Dream Kanai stole the show with a number of spectacular dunks including a nasty poster dunk on Jefford as well as an alley-hoop slam. Kanai started with a baseline two-handed slam over Jefford before throwing on a sick one-handed tomahawk dunk. Kanai finished his show with a two-handed alley hoop from star guard Shelroy Thomas. West Indies and Guyana's cricketer Christopher Barnwell was the top scorer for Team Bond with 10 points, while James 007 Bond had 6. Kanai ended with a team high 15 points while Tony had 12 in the loss. Bond thanked all the sponsors of the game as well as the fans for supporting the charity event as the organizers aim to continue their work by adding more respect to the game. In the earlier exhibition games, UG defeated Qualfun 79-44, Stars Computer defeated the Diplomatic Corp 65-51 and St. Rose's High defeated St. Stanish Laws College 1913. Finally, some cricket news. Stephen Smith will become Australia's 45th Test Captain after being confirmed to replace Michael Clark as leader for the remainder of the series against India. Smith has officially taken over the Test Vice Captaincy from Brad Haddon as the Australia selectors sought a more long-term solution than temporarily handing control to the 37-year-old Haddon. Smith, 25, had widely been tipped as the next full-time captain after Clark, but had not previously been groomed in an official capacity in the same way Clark had been as vice-captain on the Ricky Ponting. However, the uncertainty surrounding Clark's fitness had given his ongoing hamstring and back problems prompted a rethink from the selectors. And with that, we've come to the end of sport, which is sponsored by Mark Hopkins. That's a wrap as well in the evening news for today, Monday, December 15, 2014. Of course, you can find these and many more stories in tomorrow's edition of the Ghana Times. 
and you can join us on TVG Channel 28 and on Radio Guyana Inc. 89.3 in Esikobo, 89.5 in George Chicken Environs and 89.7 in Burbies and Unicary, Suriname. We now leave you with a song by Candice Field titled This is Christmas. She was at a time performing at a Ghana Telephone and Telegraph Company's Limited Concert and Gift Presentation at the Theatre Guild on Friday evening. Enjoy. Mm -hmm. 